The Baltimore Ravens are 2024 draft winners. We talk about why and so much more coming up next on this episode of Lockdown Ravens. You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostreicher of Ravens Wire, here with you on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. Thank you so much for being here, making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every day or free and available on all podcasting platforms. That includes in video form on YouTube where you can like the video, subscribe to the channel, also in audio form wherever you get your podcasts, so Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you choose to listen. We're five days a week of Baltimore Ravens content here. Even in the offseason, as we're now getting into the little bit of the lull period, the draft is officially over, so Ravens news, analysis, updates, and more we have you covered. Be sure to tell a friend, tell a family member as well. If they're looking for daily Ravens coverage, we have them covered here on Locked On Ravens. Today's episode of Locked On Ravens is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit I have a competitive side, and it's a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. Still uh, still recovering from the busyness of draft weekend, Baltimore 9 total picks. I actually I did the whole episode for yesterday, for Monday, and after I finished it, I realized I meant to do that topic for today and this topic I was going to do. So I switched up Monday and Tuesday shows, but the content continues. It's been a grind here. It's been a fun grind, obviously. Exhausting, but fun. We're going to keep at it here on Locked on Ravens. Talking about the draft still. And we talked about winners and losers specifically. That was more player, coach-oriented. Even we threw some draft picks in there as well. So if you want to listen to that, be sure to check out yesterday's episode. But today I want to talk about it from a a holistic perspective, more general perspective of why the Ravens were 2024 draft winners. And I'm not saying they were the sole winners or the biggest winners of the draft, but I do think you look at the draft as a whole – and we'll talk about it, right? Why they're winners. Also, there were some areas where you kind of like, oh, is that the right pick? So again, was it a perfect draft? No, but I still think the Ravens came out as winners as a whole. Then we'll get into a little bit more of the draft class, get into an update on some guys. Nate Wiggins already working out. So we have some updates on those guys. And I'll use that opportunity also to just talk about them a little bit more as well. Then on the final part of the show, you're going to want to stay tuned for this because Rashad Bateman, there is some contract craziness going on with him. We got a lot more context yesterday on just why Bateman's deal went the way it did and why he signed the extension, why the extension was just so little money. We also got the, the specs on the deal. So tons of craziness with the shot Bateman. Stay tuned for that. Good. We're, we're going to talk about it all here on the show. But let's get into why the Ravens are draft winners now. And to me, I think that there are multiple different angles I want to look at this from. The first one being positions of need. The Ravens have been a BPA team for, you know, who knows how long. You can go back years and years and years. But when we did our mock draft, Monday's on Locked on Ravens here, when we talked about what the Ravens need, I had the big four. It was edge, it was offensive line, it was cornerback, it was wide receiver. No particular order. I mean, obviously wide receiver trumps edge. It was the biggest need for sure. But first four rounds, Baltimore gets corner, offensive line, edge, and wide receiver. They address their needs. Now, that doesn't mean that the Ravens couldn't have taken a wide receiver a little earlier, offensive lineman a little earlier, right? There were opportunities for the Ravens to maybe switch up the order a little bit. But I think they also didn't reach, especially, well, I'll say they didn't reach early. I think a little later with guys like Devin Leary, that that was a pick they maybe could have gone a different direction in. But again, I'm, I'm grading the picks. I'm putting more stock into the higher ones as opposed to the lower ones because obviously you expect Nate Wiggins to have more of an impact than Snoozy Kane, right? I mean, hey, look, hopefully Snoozy Kane has a role this year, but you have higher expectations for Nate Wiggins, and so I'm grading that pick and putting more emphasis on that pick as opposed to the picks later down the line. So Baltimore, we knew going into this draft they had needs. We knew they had to address those needs because this is an opportunity for them, and the reason I love it is because the Ravens, Every honestly, it's every team, it's not just Baltimore. But for Baltimore, when you talk about positions of need for them this season, this offseason, their positions of need were premium positions, offensive tackle or just offensive line as a whole, premium. Talk about wide receiver, premium, cornerback, premium, edge rusher, premium. And we've seen throughout, I mean, we want to go back and look at examples from this free agency. 
You look at Robert Hunt, who got $100 million from Carolina. Damian Lewis got 54 from Carolina. The wide receiver market's going crazy right now. Corners are getting $100 million plus. And obviously, offensive linemen, we talked about that too. But every single premium position market, it is so valuable for teams to get quality playmakers at those positions on rookie contracts. Four-year deals, five-year deals with the fifth-year option of the first-rounders. Getting Nate Wiggins on a rookie deal plus a fifth-year option is huge. I mean, it is. Roger Rosengarten, if he can be a solid contributor, having him on a rookie deal, especially with the way the Ravens now have to maneuver in this post-rookie contract Lamar Jackson world. And it's not just on Lamar, as I've mentioned before. You know, you have just Matt BK's extension. You have Kyle Hamilton and Tyler Linderbaum coming out of the pipeline in a couple of years, right? So the Ravens have to operate a little differently, but every team needs to have those types of quality playmakers on rookie deals. Because if you don't, it gets a little dicey with how much a really quality veteran, you know, maybe prime cornerback wants. Or what do you have to give up to get that number one wide receiver? Now, for Baltimore, the reason I like this as well is because the Ravens seemingly prioritized a couple of different things. I think athleticism was certainly one of those, especially speed. You talk about Nate Wiggins, the 428. Rosengarten has the ability to get to the second level, solid foot speed. If he's Isaac has some athleticism to him, and we know Tez Walker with the speed too. Now, obviously, there's room for both Nate Wiggins and Roger Rosengarten to add some, some weight, some, some sand in the pants, as everybody's been saying. But it seemed like they did prioritize. It's not only traits, right? You're not only looking at traits for the Ravens. They don't do that. But then you look to a pick like TJ Tampa, where he didn't test super well in terms of the 40, but Baltimore's not going to absolutely take you off their board if you don't have a, a great combine for a lot of players. So Tampa was somebody, it was a combination draft. And, and personally, I'm a big fan of combination drafts. And I'm cutting this off. I mean, probably after the first six picks, you can throw Rasheen Ali in here too. But it was a combination draft to taking positions of need with the best player available. To me, you can use BPA right in lockstep, right in hand. You know, you, you hold the hands here with BPA in one hand and you have needs based in the other. And you can literally just use them side by side because if you're Baltimore, as I've mentioned this scenario multiple times already, after Tyler Guyton won at 29, in my opinion, there were no other offensive linemen worthy of that 30th pick. The Ravens could have reached and taken Rosengarten in the first round or Kingsley Sumatai out of BYU in the first round. But that would have been, in my opinion, like you get the need, but you're also reaching for a guy where you could have easily gotten the Nate Wiggins type pick. And then, yeah, you had to sweat it out a little bit with Rosengarten. I know the Ravens were certainly sweating it out on, on night two, but you had options there, even if Rosengarten wasn't still available. So you're not reaching for an offensive lineman in the first round. And then that run on corners happens and it kind of messes you up in terms of, oh, well, who's still available? The Ravens got one of the best corners in this class, and then they get a really quality offensive line prospect too. Now, another reason why I think Baltimore did a really good job in this draft, particularly again in the early rounds, is because a lot of these guys feel like they can come in and contribute right away. Now, not every one of these guys is going to have a big role. I mean, again, if we're cutting this off at the first pick, six picks, I mean, obviously, uh, Devin Leary is not going to have a role this year, right? He's competing for the third quarterback job. We don't have to talk about that. And Samak is the guy that, you know, backup center, right? Not going to compete. So, Nusi Kane, you know, th there's there's an option for him to maybe have a dime linebacker role or, or whatnot. But, again, you have potential for Nate Wiggins to really step in and be not even just a rotational guy, but the Ravens love their three corner rotations on the outside. So he's going to play a lot. You can play him on the outside, play him in the slot. I expect him to have a big year one role. Rosengarten to me is the favorite to win that right tackle job. Daniel Fadley, they is going to be competing for that, but Rosengarten, you're probably going to get value out of that second rounder, especially if he plays well and is playing a lot. Adisa Isaac, it's kind of up in the air for me. I still think there are three guys ahead of him right now on the depth chart, maybe maybe even four if you want to throw Tavius Robinson's name there, depending on how you believe in him. But that's that's one where I'm kind of iffy, and that's why I said love the player, but position-based need. You know, you can talk about maybe taking another offensive lineman there, taking a, a wide receiver at that pick. But then you talk about Tez Walker, Devon Tez Walker, who I do expect to have a role. Again, he's not going to be wide receiver one, right? Not Nobody's expecting that, but I still think that he can come in and the Ravens will have probably some deep packages for him and maybe those routes you sent Rashad Bateman on, sent Zay Flowers on last year. Tez Walker can be that, take the top off, and plus bigger body contested catch wide receiver. The Ravens also drafted guys that fit the, the, the needs, but also fit the types 
that that need needed. And what I mean by that is, for example, the Ravens needed a big bodied wide receiver who can come down with contested catches. And Devon says Walker, can, he can do that stuff. So it's not like Baltimore took a lad McConkey who, you know, is really talented and probably would have had a good career in Baltimore. But, you know, the Ravens didn't necessarily need that speedy, shifty route runner wide receiver. They needed a bigger body player. And Tez Walker is that. So talk about Roger Rosengarten, the athleticism. It seems like Baltimore wants to build up their athletic offensive line now because it, with the three starters leaving, it gives them an opportunity to reset their offensive line a little bit. It seems like Baltimore wanted to get more athletic. They added an athletic tackle. So they drafted their needs, but they also drafted the skill sets they needed within those needs. So a lot of reasons to like Baltimore's draft as a whole. Obviously, again, it wasn't a perfect draft. I'm not saying it was. I'm not saying they're the, the biggest winners of the draft cycle this year. When you take a step back and look at it, there's a good chance that multiple players from this draft class contribute early on in their careers, with the potential for others to step up as their careers go on. And for a Baltimore team that's looking to compete for a championship, I think it's a good balance between getting guys that can help this year and drafting guys that are also ceiling plays as well. Coming up, though, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the 2024 draft class, getting into an update and a lot more state team play to talk about here on Lockdown Ravens. First, this show is brought to you by Monopoly Go. All right, game off. we got to pause here to talk more about Monopoly Go. I know what you're saying. Flag on the play. You already talked about that, but there is just so much more good stuff in this game. In Monopoly Go, you can team with friends for time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you unlock, and there's so much to get. Unique stickers you can trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes. Cool new playing pieces to travel the boards with. Hilarious emojis for taunting friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels... New and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or a Robot Pachanko Machine. And there's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and go download it now for free on Google Play or the App Store. Game on. We're back. Our second segment of Locked on Ravens. Kevin Oshrick is still here with you on this Taco Tuesday. Really appreciate everybody for being here with me again, making Locked on Ravens. Your first listen each and every day. Let's dive into a bit of a draft update here, a draft class update for the Ravens. Actually, we saw Nate Wiggins already working out in his Ravens gear, put up an Instagram live. He was actually trying to be flashy and uh, catch like one hand interceptions. And the, the live chat was, was getting on him. He's like, turn the, turn the live off. You lock in with the live. But it, it was funny. He was having fun with it and everything. There's actually a viral clip from uh, before Wiggins was drafted where Kay Adams on the Up and Adams show. He, he was getting ready to do an interview with her, but his bed wasn't made off to the side. And she said, make your bed. And he, you know, he's sitting there making the bed before the live hit happened. So it, it was really funny. But there were a couple of interesting comments that we didn't really get to go over, specifically from the Ravens and their post-draft press conferences on all three days. And it feels like Eric DaCosta, John Harbaugh, they understand, especially with the top two picks and Nate Wiggins and Roger Rosengarten, that, you know, when it comes to the NFL and their frames right now, again, Nate Wiggins more so up in the 180 pound range. Roger, Ro Roger Rosengarten, excuse me, is more up in the 308, 310 pound range. You, you'd like to see a little more weight added on there. Now, Again, Eric DeCosta, John Harbaugh feels confident that those guys will be able to grow into their bodies. Mentioning for Nate Wiggins, just 20 years old right now. So th there, there is room for them to grow. Now, what I would expect here, just personally, is I think we're not going to see a ton of change early in their rookie season. I feel like where we're going to see the change is when they get a full offseason, a full NFL offseason. They're on a full NFL strength program and have that for a full offseason. It can be a little difficult to adjust early on and things. I'm sure the Ravens will try to get them as close as possible. But again, it's about them filling in and figuring things out. But I don't think that's going to necessarily hinder them to the point of, oh, you can't play them, right? Nate Wiggins, obviously a very successful college career over at Clemson. Roger Rosengarten, the same thing over at Washington. Now, a couple of other things, Roger Rosengarten discussed it. Nate Wiggins discussed it. You know, Harbaugh, Acosta, everybody. The Ravens found players, and this we can kind of throw this back into why the Ravens are draft winners here, but versatility. Versatility is the name of the game here, and again, everybody talked about it during the press conferences, and the coaches in particular seemed very excited, and, and more specifically, if you want to talk about Wiggins as a whole, of being able to 
Use Marlon potentially on the inside in the slot. Use Wiggins in there as well. Move guys all around with Rosengarten, him having the left tackle experience, but also obviously playing on the right side at Washington. It's that versatility that Baltimore loves. The NFL is going in that direction as well. So versatility is key. And it helps also with injuries. I mean, the the, the most versatile player on the Ravens, in my opinion, and there, there are a couple you could probably put in this conversation, but Patrick McCary is my guy. I mean, you look at a guy that play all five positions on the line, sign me up for that. And that's a guy that is versatile. But Wiggins, again, he will help in a bunch of different packages. I mean, TJ Tampa potentially can play some safety looks if you want him to. I mean, that's that's a potential option. So versatility was one of the names of the game for this Ravens draft class. And I'm really excited to see how that all unfolds here. But I think the the biggest thing for me, and we'll talk about this as the week goes on, as the months go on, but the corner position. Nate Wiggins is the key guy here, right? But I just mentioned TJ Tampa, and I mentioned this a couple of different times. But let's let's take a step back and look at where the Ravens cornerback room was last year. Obviously, Marlon Humphrey, pretty injured for the majority of the season, had a couple of tough injuries he had to work back from. Brandon Stevens obviously stepped up in a huge way, and that essentially happened because there were so many injuries in training camp, Marlon's being one of them, where they're just like, right, we have to move you back to corner. And obviously, he stepped up and played very good football during the year. Ronald Darby stepped up too. That's another guy, right? But he's now gone to Jacksonville. They had other players step up over the course of the year. I mean, again, the slot position, Arthur Millette, good. Ardarius Washington, hopefully I'm, I have big hopes for him. Pepe Williams, Jalen Armour Davis. But you essentially replace Ronald Darby and Rocky Yassin with Nate Wiggins and TJ Tampa. That to me is one heck of an upgrade. I've, I've talked about this on multiple shows here as well but it's about upgrading. And I think when you talk about the draft outside of the first couple of rounds, people are like, okay, those are the positions you can upgrade a guy at. But once you get to the third, fourth, fifth, you're not upgrading your draft into the future, but that's not particularly true. I mean, we saw Adisa Isaac and TJ Tampa, both consensus second round guys fall to the Ravens at number nine. What was it? 93 for Isaac and 130 for TJ Tampa, third and fourth rounds there respectively. That is great value. And so you're drafting in the fourth round, but you're drafting a second round player in the fourth round. And again, guys fall for different reasons, medicals, combine testing, whatever, whatever it is, off field stuff. Right. But the Ravens, again, the off field stuff, they don't really mess with I mean, We know that, but in terms of combine testing medicals depends on how they feel both as a medical staff and then them reporting back to the decision makers. But the Ravens take advantage of stuff like that. We've seen the BPA thing work for them, where sometimes you just have to take a guy and figure it out. The Ravens, to me, the, the, the process in those first five, even six picks, I liked the process there. Last two or three, I, I thought it maybe dropped off a little bit with the Devin Leary pick and, and et cetera there. So Nusi Kane, I think, is a good player. But to me, I just think that you look at how they did it, where it's still addressing needs. You're still getting guys at premium positions, but you're just letting the board fall to you. And this is the second straight. Well, essentially it's not exactly, but the second straight year where there are no trades. I mean, I know the Ravens traded into the sixth or into the seventh round last year to get Andrew Voorhees. I'm not necessarily counting that one though. I mean, I'm, I'm saying really two straight years of no big trades for the Ravens trading up or down. And I think we've, we've come to know this Ravens organization is one that, oh, they're going to, move up and down the draft board and EDC loves moving, but past two years has, hasn't really been that way. So Baltimore, I think liked the way the board fell to them early. They understood there were going to be a bunch of offensive players going off the board. First offensive player didn't go till 15. And that really helped push those corners down. It pushed Wiggins down. Baltimore had a plan on all three days with that first pick. It was Nate Wiggins day one, Roger Rosengarten day, day two. And you have uh Tez Walker day three. They hit, they were three for three. You know, they said that was, those were their three guys and they got all three of them. So I think they liked the way the board fell to them. They used BPA, they used their needs. And I thought it was overall a very solid way for the Ravens to execute, especially in those first six picks of the draft. Coming up though, we have a lot to talk about with Rashad Bateman. There is some craziness going on with this contract. It's all done. He signed the deal, but there is a lot coming out about why the situation happened the way it happened. Stay tuned. we got a lot to get to on Lockdown Ravens.
First, this show is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball is in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed it's $150. bucks. we are going to lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all not the safe, secure, and easy to use. And for me, I'm <laughs> I'm a big Denver Nuggets guy. I'm actually recording this after Game 5. Jamal Murray has saved my life once again, so if you bet on, uh, on Jamal Murray – was questionable to play, and, and I am I am very thankful he did. But Denver, they win the series in five. So if you bet Nuggets in five on FanDuel, you're, you're liking that. Minnesota-Denver, second round, going to be a really good series if you want to get ahead of that and look at those options over on FanDuel. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash Lockdown. Make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. And the show is brought to you by DK Law Group. When you need a law firm, do you want the legal runaround or would you rather have a no-nonsense approach? Well, you get the latter with DK Law Group. DK Law Group is a Maryland-based law firm who is redefining the legal process with their modern approach. DK Law Group specializes in real estate, law, estate planning, business law, and family law. They're tech savvy. They treat clients like family, and they focus on keeping your legal solutions simple. DK Law Group is a woman-led firm with Diana Khan at the helm. Diana has been called an unparalleled legal expert by some. One of the things you'll quickly notice with DK Law Group is their transparent pricing. They believe in clarity and cost and no one left in limbo. DK Law Group knows that speed is key by leveraging technology. DK Law Group streamlines the process to serve you better and faster. Contact DK Law Group today at DKLawMD.com. Lockdown listeners can call today to schedule a free 30-minute consultation when you mention the tagline, Empowering Legacies. We're back. Our final segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Ostriker still talking with you here. Thank you so much again for being here and making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every day. Be sure to, again, subscribe, follow along here, video form, audio form. You can like the video on YouTube. You can hit that follow button in audio form. Really appreciate all the communities we've built here, really. It's been one heck of a journey. I'm coming up on five years and a couple months of hosting Locked On Ravens. I've never missed a weekday episode. So if you want consistency, I really try to bring that on a daily basis, Monday through Friday, with Ravens news analysis updates for an every day, or you've been with me for maybe almost those five years. Thank you so much for tuning in every single day. If you maybe started a couple of years after that, a couple months after that, whatever it may be, thank you for checking in with me all the time. If it's your first time in, welcome into the channel. Welcome to the show. Hopefully you're enjoying the content here. We got a lot more Ravens content coming before the season starts, and obviously we'll continue through the season. If you're somewhere in the middle also, thank you for checking in again. Let's get into Rashad Bateman. It's been a very, very controversial topic when it comes to Bateman and his role on the Ravens, if, if he should be traded or not. Baltimore signed him to an extension through 2026, so he's not going anywhere. But we finally got the particulars of the deal yesterday, and also we got some very interesting insight on just everything that happened here. So I'm going to just read through everything, try to summarize it up as best I can, and then we'll talk about it. So... There's context here. Jess Rebeck of The Athletic, who does a great job, he ended up putting this out there. He said a bit of context on the Bateman deal. He was not eligible for a fifth-year option on the rookie contract because he's only been credited with two accrued seasons. That's a result of him starting last season's training camp on the did-not-report list. And so he continued, said, per the CBA, a player shall not receive an accrued season for any league year in which the player is under contract to a club and in which he failed to report to the club's preseason training camp on that player's mandatory reporting date. So Bateman would have been a restricted free agent next year. But of course, obviously that doesn't necessarily matter at this point because the extension was signed. So it feels like this was just a, a miscommunication. Rashad Bateman did fire his agent last summer. This probably stemming from this incident, which look, I, I don't blame him. This cost him a, a decent chunk of money. Obviously the fifth year option was a pretty big deal was right around 14 or so million dollars and he essentially lost all leverage there. So in, in my opinion, this was probably the best he could do. The organization gives him, you know, a, a little bit of leeway. Maybe the cost of felt a little bad for Bateman. They really could have just let him play the year out. They could have tendered him and, and, you know, they instead helped him out with the extension. They get him a little bit more money in that first year as opposed to what the tender would have been. So, I think it, it had to work out that way for both sides. So the particulars of the deal, I, I forgot to say those. Let me let me pull it up quickly here. It was a oh, if I can find it. Well, here first of all, let's actually get into what the ten the tenders were. So the projected tenders for next year, the first round tender is going to be right around seven million dollars, six point nine million. Second round tender, four point nine million, 
and right of first refusal is $3 million. So the Ravens probably would have put that second round tender on Bateman. So he would have had 2.2 this year, 4.9 next year. And the Ravens ended up getting that third year by maybe offering just a little bit more money as well. Now, in terms of the particulars, um, <laughs> Still trying to roll through and find it. I believe Field Yates had the particulars on the deal. So trying to pull that up. But for, for Bateman, again, he was put in a pretty awful situation. But to me, he and the organization got a deal that based off of the circumstances was fair in in a way. So it kind of is what it is. So you're factoring in his new two-year extension. Ravens wide receiver Rashad Bateman is now set to earn a base value of $15.25 million over the next three seasons. He has an additional escalator for 2026 of $1.5 million that brings the max value of the deal $16.75 million. You would have told me that Rashad Bateman would be on that almost essentially $5 million per year for three years. I would have said, sign me up. I understand there's a risk in, in the whole conversation about what is he going to do and how is he going to perform. But to me, he's a good enough player with sky high potential to the fact if you can secure him for $5 million per year, I think that's that's a totally fine deal. What was We had kind of heard those numbers. It was a little low based off the fifth-year option. But now knowing that there is no fifth-year option or there was no fifth-year option in play, I think Bateman did the best he could for himself. The Ravens, maybe, you know, I mean, like they got a really good deal out of this whole thing. Now the question becomes, can he step up and be consistent in that wide receiver two role? That's obviously been the big point and the big conversation here for Rashad Bateman. So even if he doesn't and, you know, it doesn't work out in terms of him being consistent, I still think having him on the $5 million per year deal almost – is fine because you could maybe bring in another guy next off season. And then you have Bateman in a little bit of a reduced role, but you're paying him 5 million per season. So it's not like you're paying anything crazy. Not like you're paying 10 or 15 per season. It's, it's just five. And I say, I say just five, like it's not a lot of money. Of course, 5 million is a lot of money. So, I mean, congrats to Bateman. Congrats to the Ravens. I think that again, for that price, you, you can sign me up for that 10 times out of 10. The potential is there but there is a little bit of a risk involved in it as well. So again, the wide receiver room as it stands right now, Zay Flowers, Rashad Bateman, Tez Walker, Nelson Aguilar, Deontay Hardy, Tylen Wallace. Those are your six. I know there's been rumblings about Odell potentially coming back. I just, I, I don't see it unless he, it's in a reduced role it is, or they get rid of Tylen Wallace. I think those are the two situations. And even if they do get rid of Tylen Wallace, they keep six with Odell. I think it would still have to be in a reduced role. I don't know what Odell's looking for at this point in his career, but o Odell coming back and having the role he did, Bateman would be looking over his shoulder again. We'd be having the conversation about who's wide receiver two, who I, who's wide receiver three. I just, I feel like that's not good for Bateman's development. If you truly believe in Rashad Bateman, if you're the Ravens, you say, we're giving you this role. We know, we know you're going to do amazing things with it. Let, let's go out here and let's ride. So to me, you do the Russell Wilson, let's ride, and, and you ride with Bateman. That's what the Ravens, they should do if they believe in him. It is a risk. Again, I'm not saying it's not, but we'll see how it all unfolds for him. That's all I have on Locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Coming up tomorrow, of course, more Ravens content for you, so be sure to subscribe, follow along. I'll see you right back here tomorrow on Locked on Ravens.